Hi, this is Shadi and today we're going to be talking yet again about the history of Neewaza and how it came to be. Now, when I first started doing this a little over a year ago, I found out that the truth wasn't as simple as it was. It's not this romanticized uh, story of someone who's frail and just developed everything out of nothing. It's a grand mixture of a lot of people working together, giving and receiving from each other, and hence this ground game existed. Uh, the general narrative goes is that, you know, uh, the Kodokan had some ground submissions like the old Jujutsu of the battlefields, and then someone that was very frail and weak in Brazil learned judo and then started to really craft the ground game to suit him best because he cannot throw a big opponents so he had to rely on the ground and he had to rely on the guard which he himself invented so but now we know with people like Robert Drysdale um, if you study the old Kodokan masters you study the old stories of uh, the Butoku Kai competitions you would know that history is far more complicated than the general romanticized narrative so I've talked about Kaichiro Samura in the past I've briefly mentioned him in the stories uh, of how the Kodokan developed their Newata and it was specifically th through the challenges at the Butoku Kai in Kyoto uh, Tanabe was beating the Kodokan Judokas and Hajime Isogai did not like that whatsoever so uh, he started training in Neiwaza, he had a trilogy with Tanabe and specifically for the third one and the one where he wanted to end it all and really dominate Tanabe, he trained uh, or asked for in particular Kaichiro Samura, the man you are seeing in front of you. So Kaichiro Samura was known to have good Neiwaza so he helped Hajime Isogai uh, to be his uke in order to prepare for the final battle against Tanabe in order to redeem the Kodokan and defend the honor of the Kodokan. So who is Kaichiro Samura? Where does he come from? And why is his part so vital in the development of Neiwaza uh, before people like Tsunetane Oda and many others? So Kaichiro Samura was born on November 13th, 1880 in Kumamoto, Japan. He is one of the 15th uh, men that earned the 10th dan of the Kodokan. He earned it back in May of 1948 at the age of 68 years old. So, and he is also one of the 10th uh, dan who lived the longest. So, his father Masaki Samura was a Jiu-Jitsu master particularly in the Takina Uchi Santo Ryu uh, Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, I looked up some of the footage to see whether they have some Niwaza or uh, some sort of uh, ground control, but uh, nonetheless, it was pretty much all standard Jiu-Jitsu practices of uh, self-defense, either standing or kneeling. So uh, he was later appointed a Judo teacher at the Metropolitan Police Academy in Tokyo. So because of his father he started training jiu-jitsu since childhood but at the age of 18 he uh, was enrolled in the Kodokan the same year he got his first uh, degree black belt or his shodan and just a year later he became second dan and appointed uh, a teacher at the Butoku Kai with special mention so here we start to see uh, the pattern continues with all these judokas specifically the grandmasters or people like uh, Kimura or Mifune, uh, they were promoted uh, quite uh, fast and uh, they were very eager to prove themselves, you know, second dan in the uh, second year. And now here we see going to the Butoku Kai, which means that there is some sort of uh, ground expertise to be gained. So in 1898, at the age of 18 years old, he started studying law at the Meiji uh, University and entered the Kodokan in July of that year. So uh, a year later in 1899, he became the head of the Judo section of the Butoku Kai and made extensive trips uh, into schools and police establishments. He was not the head instructor, but uh, he was head of the uh, Judo section. So kind of like a administration or administrator, 
like some sort of a administration position uh, rather than the head teacher because keep in mind it was uh, Hajime Isogai that took on that uh, particular spot or position in order to be the head instructor in Kyoto or the Butokai in particular. So in 1903 he was appointed a professor of judo at the Kagoshima College and then he held a position of technical director in several uh, colleges like Hiroshima, Shihan, uh, Nagoya, Fu uh, Fukuoka, Busan, Kyoto. So here his ties with Kyoto and uh, particularly Niwaza is uh, rather strong. So he was one of the, like I said, if he had this big uh, administrative position, he was most likely working with Hajime Isogai on the curriculums and really focusing uh, on Niwaza and giving birth like to grandmasters like Tsunetani Oda. So he, in July of uh, 1913, he began, he began teaching at the Dainippon uh, Butokukai and also the Gakko Bujutsu Senmon. So uh, he was mostly a teacher, not so much so a competitor, but his influence was behind closed doors in the offices that gave birth to this Newaza. So. In August of 1931, Samura returned to the Kodokan and from December of 1937, he was uh, an instructor and remained there as the dojo, part of the dojo advisory group. So he became ninth dan the same year, 1937, and 11 years later, 1948, he became tenth dan, uh, one of the 15 members, and he passed away at the age of 84 on November 6th. Uh, 1964 so in this December of that same year or a month after his death he was awarded the Hushu Shiju or the purple ribbon medal in honor of his work so why is Kaichiro Samura so important now Kaichiro Samura first of all when it came to the battle of proving the uh, excellency of the Kodokan in the challenges at the Butokukai he played a vital role, not necessarily a direct role, but uh, crafting the Newaza alongside Hajime Isogai is a great uh, role to take. Also, while he took uh, a position in the administration being the chief uh, of the judo sections, uh, he most likely uh, gave his spin of the curriculum, like I said. And there the Kyoto branches took on this uh, focus of Newaza, and this is how we ended up with a lot of Newaza at, at least before the uh, Second World War, before all these Kyoto branches uh, closed down. So here you start to see how complicated history is from uh, people that had direct effect being on the mats, uh, people like Hajime Isogai, people like uh, Tsunetane Oda. Tsunetane Oda, his curriculum was extremely uh, like fanatic to the point that he eliminated everything from kata, nagewaza, everything, atemiwaza, and just sticked to newaza so much so that he was starting to recognize as his own school. People were also starting to call it Sunetani Ryu. I talked about this in my uh, Jigoro Kano versus Sunetani Oda, where they had this critique of each other. One wanted to remain it like old classical mainly focused on self-defense and the other wanted it to make it solely on the ground to beat everyone and capture all the trophies and all the medals uh, of the school's uh, competition so uh, for example recently i also did a helio gracie versus kano and a lot of people pointed out that people talked about helio's childhood as if it was kano's childhood to make it more uh, appealing that uh, he became this ground master, he, can, he couldn't do a pull-up, etc. And then he started to work on leverage and position and the guard. Uh, and this is just a little less than 100 years ago. So in the 1930s, etc. when Helio was really training, uh, he was doing this. So if something that recent happened and there's so misconception about it and so much false narratives, just imagine the history of humanity in general and just the thought about uh, this particular subject is really disturbing just how much skewed our reality can be now I don't know how much 
history is uh, played with. I know for a fact that it is played with, but just something so recent. We have all the data, all the written history, all the documentation, and still so much folklore and so much uh, hearsay. Uh, not just about the Gracies and the early uh, roots of Jiu-Jitsu, uh, which is why someone like Robert Drysdale went on this particular adventure to uh, reveal it or make it in a way that it is comprehensible and uh, just clear as day and not so much so rely on hearsay, but also the early days of the Kodokan, the 1886 uh, story. We know that from the records, uh, barely any evidence of it and also um, someone like the head, the chief police at the police uh, academy in Tokyo, uh, Mishima, he was a progressive, so he was most likely to go f more for the Kodokan rather than the old uh, Yoshin Ryu schools, and it was a time of change in Japan. So there is so much folklore and myth in the last 140 years, so it's really just amazing how. Uh, 100% sure we can be certain that history is played with. Uh, there's so many false narratives that we cannot, uh, how do you say, figure out for ourselves. Played with the evidence, uh, written false records, uh, so uh, so on and so forth. So it's nice that at least we can do our fair share in order to reveal the history of something that's recent and something that we dedicate uh, years of our lives in into practice years of our lives on the mats so uh, it's nice to be able to paint a clear image of how things happened and why we are here uh, what took place in order for us to get here rather than just listen to hearsay so if you have anything else to add please uh, let me know down below also consider supporting me on patreon um, i have content that's exclusive for the patrons only i have a few videos up uh, now so if you are uh, willing to support my project, please, uh, the link is in the description. Also, uh, if you have anything else to add to this conversation, let me know down below. This was Shadi, and thank you for listening.